Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. What's up, dog? What's up, dude? Is this coming through the good mic or is it coming through the computer? Oh, hold on, I gotta put on uh, multi output. Try it again. How's that? Better. Perfect. All right, we're good. Microphone is on. It's this mic, right? Like if I go next to it, sounds like it's coming through this mic. I guess so. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, your mic's better than me, dude. Look, man, I'm not here for funny stuff. I'm just here to get paid. So I don't know, like, if that's some sort of an underhanded remark about me and microphones. I don't know what you're trying to say, but let's just keep the let's just keep the underhanded remarks to a minimum. I'm just here for oh, but my look because uh, I'm just if, here for the I'm just here for the clout. Uh, well, it's not gonna be if I can't make underhanded remarks, there probably isn't much to talk about because. <laughs> Well, <laughs> so I mean, so I, I got a couple note cards, but here's the underhanded remark note uh, notebook, so you can yeah. see it's full. <laughs> okay. Uh, just kidding, live? just kidding. We are live. By, by the way, everybody, yeah. here he is. He's back. Nobody else has the clout and the e-celeb pull to bring Tristan back, other than myself. Literally, no one else could do it. I did it. You took a long break. I know that. You had a hard time with me putting out so many hot singles in the rap game, and you kind of like kind of faded. So I'm sorry. I got to apologize for putting you out of the game. Sorry, are you talking to me? I was just playing Candy Crush. What do you? What do you? Are you saying stuff? Candy you're saying Crush. Things? Yeah. Uh, uh, what on your 2005 iPod? You think, yeah, does no, that, on, does on Candy Facebook, Crush even I'm, exist anymore? No, this is what important people do. We play Candy Crush on Facebook. Uh, anyways, I, I, well, I was just my playing people, Farmville, people, so I was playing Farmville, so I guess that, that evens out. I was playing well, 20, 2014 Facebook Farmville. Anyways, my people said my people told me I'm doing this podcast today. Uh, James, James Dyer, Di, James Dyer's show. So good to meet you. I got a few notes here. They said flatter him. So hi, you look so good. You're really handsome. Your hair is long and stuff. Um, they say they say don't overdress. He will get insecure if you're dressed better than him. So I dress down. I don't know what I'm here for. Anyways, Fight Club or something. Yes. Yeah. So I'm actually dressed as you in the movie Reign of Fire. Do you remember being in that film? Oh no, I've actually never seen. It. What is what is Reign of Fire? <laughs> what do you mean you've never seen it? You're freaking. I've never it, even dude. heard of it. Not only have I never seen, it, I've never even heard of this Boomer movie. What year a boomer out? movie. So you think movies from the two thousands are boomer? Two thousand, bro, bro. I don't. I hang out with Zoomers, man. Like my friends have perms. Oh, yeah, it's, that's not weird at all. <laughs> I'll hang out with. I'll hang out with Zoomers. I hang out with children. You're weird. No, no I'm cap, just joking. So, no uh, can you see that? I mean, this is Matthew McConaughey from. I know who that is. Who's that? Yes, you do. It's you right there. Rain, rain of fire. It's freaking you, dude. Even your brother, your oh, so-called I'm, I'm brother. That man, I don't have, I don't have time to be watching, watching these movies. I'm too busy living. L i v i n. This was in the 2000s. You had time in the 2000s to watch Rain of Fire. Man, in the 2000s, I mean, I was like hanging out with celebrities and stuff, like kicking it with uh, Paris Hilton, Nikki Hilton. I don't know if you've heard of them, <laughs> but um, Britney Spears. You were, you were hanging out with Arlen Specter and. Uh, yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald, Jeff Stein McEffrey. That's the celebrities. You're, so hold on. So where were you been at? Were you, I heard, rumor is the internet was saying you were part of some kind of breeding program somewhere or something. So is that? I mean, it's not like unheard. Of. I don't really. I'm I'm not really at liberty to say where I've been, but what I can say is that it's way cooler than whatever you've been doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the internet was the internet thought that was probably the case too. So <laughs> that, that I wasn't addressing you personally. I was addressing <laughs> the internet in general. Just wherever I was, way way cooler than whatever you was doing. You got to do that a little bit, little bit cooler like Matthew McConaughey. There you go. Can you see him? Tell me that doesn't look like freaking you, dude. Let me. I, where is that? Would you have it pulled up? Oh, I'm, let me pull up the stream. I, I was just looking at um, yeah. Zoom here. So let me pull up the stream. You're like, what is it? James Dyer at YouTube dot org yes. or whatever. Correct. Okay. Does yeah. You know, okay. I, given the fact that you don't put up videos on your channel anymore, I can see why you don't remember the what YouTube is. You had to you pretty much had to retire from YouTube, didn't you? I mean, yeah. Is that what happened? Well, I mean, I've, I'm just I'm contractually obliged to uh, to kind of keep things under wraps. Contractually, like, like you have in contractions. You were part of a breeding program. I knew it. 
<laughs> do you not th think come on you know that looks like you dude totally all right let, hold on hold on I, jason or james uh or mr diaper whatever um diaper. <laughs> jay <laughs> diaper i like it let's go with that that's that's, 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 that's the Owen benjamin <laughs> level like childish right? <laughs> that's the new cut down it's like total third grade Wait. i like it dude all right dude that's funny because people say like people will claim you look like ragnar lothbrok but i've not watched vikings but i've obviously seen you know clips and stuff of vikings so yeah he looks is that, that looks a, is it a like medieval you. is is this like post-apocalyptic or medieval this uh screenshot it's rain of fire which is a future post-apocalypse where dragons come back to earth uh, obviously obviously it's both it's, it's post-apocalypse medieval mm -hmm. dragons. Does, anyway, he have, does he have that? They talk like Matthew McConaughey. He did. Does he that, always talks man. like Matthew McConaughey because every character he plays is a version of Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, man, I, I don't know if you got if you got a dragon that can light this up for me, man. It'd be a lot cooler if you would. <laughs> he, he thought you was talking about put, dragging on a little puff there, getting you a little bit of that puff on that. That's a different kind of drag, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, like you've been you've been hanging out under under. Underneath a mountain with all them treasures, just L I V I N. No, a drag on a uh, hit, getting a drag on a a, a smoke. That's a different kind get, of drag. Get, get a drag on that. Not smoke. <laughs> get get a little drag on that blunt or something, man. <laughs> Have you seen any of his videos? on uh i saw your i saw your video <laughs> with his video or i wouldn't have seen his video but yeah i saw the what was he saying like he just wants to do cool stuff just want to hang out with cool people and do cool stuff he man says, i'm like a i'm like a 60 year old 60s years old i'm a actually a boomer I was probably born in 1962 and i'm still just living it up my son is 24 years old well he said his son was going to camp and he said papaya i just want to meet new people and do cool things so <laughs> I like that. Did you know, <laughs> he did. You know, he did. In uh, in that movie, um, uh, what's this? The seventies movie, the one, uh, um, dazed and confused. He was actually just kind of playing him <laughs> in that movie. Like that character was kind of just him at the time. Exactly. Yeah. He's just, just his first that, role. He's just like a Texas Southern, uh, you know, weed smoking dude. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Was he like the high school girls line that he's? That was his most famous line that everyone remember. Oh, you would. Well, you know what I like about these high school girls, man. I get older, they stay the same age. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's, it seems like he just ad libbed that. Like I don't know if he if he um probably he uh but also there's a, like he's got other taglines from that movie, which I don't actually that's not a, that great of a movie. I don't know if you've seen Days and Confused. I don't I've never Oh, I've seen it, it, but yeah, I used to really like that movie when I was in like ninth grade or so, you know. Um all of his movies uh, are pretty mediocre. What's the director's name? Uh, the guy who made Waking Life. We did yeah, that. Yeah, the Waking, Waking Life. Uh, um, yeah, Alex is friends with him. I'm trying to remember his name. I, just boyhood. Went, I went blank. Did you see the, the boy, movie Boyhood? Or, um, yeah. That one was, I, that might be one of his better ones, but it was still not. It's kind of almost. Yeah. Barely. Jamie and I remember going, I actually went to the indie theater to watch <clears throat> um, the one he put, Linklater, Richard Linklater, the one that he put out yeah. about. Uh, the baseball team. Do you say that one? That was that one was odd. No. It was weird. It was almost no. like it wasn't really a movie. It was just hanging out with a baseball team from the nineteen seventies. It was weird. I've, like ne it, I've never seen. He made Slackers too, right? I've yeah. never seen Slackers. I just everyone says that one is his best one, but I don't. I can't bring myself to watch it. Well, as you guys know, tonight <clears throat> we we chose uh, a big one, one that we've not talked about. I don't know really why. I don't know. I, there's no reason exactly why on my channel we never got around to it. We just never did and. Tonight's the perfect night to do it, to get into Fight Club. And I want to remind you guys, too, that uh, I will also split the Super Chats with our beloved co-host here, Tristan Haggard of Primal Edge Health. With that 90-10, right? You get 90%, you get 10. That's how we usually do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. uh, Whatever you say, boss. Whatever you say. Um, I know that you took a long break. A lot of people are wondering, can you, can, you can you comment on... The break? Were you just doing farm stuff? It was. I mean, like legally, legally, I can't really say. Did uh, Epstein make you sign an NDA? Is that what? <laughs> Look, I've just, just the whole like the whole Andrew Tate arrest really hit me really hard. <laughs> I had a, I had a very hard time with with Top G being locked up, wrongfully accused. <laughs> top, the Top G, R.I.P. Top G. So the Matrix got to you as well. You're
I'm just saying the like the Matrix really had me really sad. So I just uh, with Top G off of YouTube, I didn't really know what to do. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other reasons. No, I've just I've just been L L I V I N. L I V I N, dog. That's the Matthew McConaughey philosophy, right? That's just that's right. <laughs> just get back, he says, "Let's get back cool to people. living." Let's get back to living. I just been hanging out with cool people, doing cool things, man. <laughs> Are you getting back to living? L I V I N. <laughs> no, um, no. I mean, there's you know, like hanging out with celebrities, uh, skydiving, uh, Blue Horizon stuff, like Mars, Mars exploration. Elon Musk, just like all that stuff. You all know? the coolest stuff that no one else has done. All, like imagine all, basically for anything watches. that's a one up, you were doing it the last yeah, yeah, like imagine all the cool things that you wish you were doing. That I didn't do? That's what you were up to. No, like all that stuff's too lame. I wouldn't even do that stuff. I was doing cooler stuff than all of that stuff. Oh, right? whoa, dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It's like, no, like no cap. Like hanging out with Zoomers and stuff, no cap. It's bussing. It's straight bussing. Yeah, not weird at all hanging out with people 20 years younger than you. I got you. Um, <laughs> I've got my new Zoomer crew. It's bussing you, every day. You, start, you got an army of Zoomers that are going to come and What if I did that? Like, came back to, all your to haters. YouTube. <laughs> came back to YouTube with just like these weird out, like weirded out, zannied up Zoomers hanging out with me. <laughs> you have a giant Speaking army of them. Speaking incoherently behind me and like laughing at bad jokes that I make. Uh, you would probably win. You would win. I mean, uh, who could beat that? I'm serious. I'm serious. Fight Club 1999. Uh, let's get into it. So real quickly before we get into the actual film, it is worth mentioning, and you can, I'll let you comment here in a second if you want on, on this topic of introduction. David Fincher. So David Fincher is... A, I would say an illuminate confirmed director, and I'll give props to the my buddies over at Psyop Cinema because they did a, a show recently, not just on Fight Club, but they did a whole David Fincher series. And you know, you find quite often he's doing films relating to dissociation, mind control, serial killers, and then prior to films, you know, Seven, this kind of stuff, uh, Dragon Tat, Girl with Dragon Tattoo. Prior to that, he was directing music videos for you know high level pop stars we're talking like george michael and madonna back in you know 80s and 90s so he comes from a a weird kind of establishment place and i think typically we know we're going to get some kind of at least subtle if not overt references to anything relating to the eliminate confirm with david fincher movies he Aronofsky made um, Black Swan, right? That wasn't Fincher, was it? Right. No, that was Aronofsky, right. but um, it, it's got like the same. It has uh, the same vibe, yeah. Yeah, same greenwashed color aesthetic, and then I, he must Aronofsky must have been a little bit influenced by Fincher's earlier style. Um, oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, Fight Club's a weird movie, man. It's. I mean, do you remember when it first came out? The advertising campaign for it. It was kind I of a bait. Switch. I don't like they made it. They tried to make it seem it was a really corny advertising campaign. And I think it really failed at the box office. Like, I don't know if they made their money back. It became a kind of a cult hit after the uh, theatrical release. Like, I didn't see it until two years after it was released in 99. I didn't watch it till like 2001 when um, like my English teacher told our class what a good movie it was. I just assumed it was corny and cheesy because of how poorly advertised it was. Um, and then, you know, everybody ruined the ending for everyone else with this movie too. So like everyone that watched this film kind of starts out knowing the twist at the end, which, you know, the twist at the end is that Edward Norton's character is Jay and then Brad Pitt is literally me. That's how it goes. Like, so just, just so you know. And we are you know. both ourselves alters in Matthew McConaughey's mind. So That's we, right. just, we just <laughs> right. went meta, meta, meta there, right? Yeah, we're in a Lincoln. We're in a Lincoln, in a Lincoln in the back. Yeah, of Lincoln. I, I was trying to think of his other movies, and I, I looked up here. Um, again, thinking establishment nods. So his first kind of, I think his breakout was, uh, well, I mean, other than the music videos, but he did Seven. Remember Seven with Brad Pitt oh, yeah. about the serial yeah. killers, right? Um, he did Zodiac. Spacey. I mean, space, to work with Spacey that intensely must have been kind of weird, I mean, knowing what we know about Kevin. Oh, Spacey exactly. Now. Yeah, well, he's... Uh, 
working with uh, Affleck in Gone Girl, and we've talked about you know the intelligence connections with Ben Affleck. He does Zodiac in 2007 again, serial return to serial killers, and then of course he does Social Network, which mm. I guess you know if you remember that he won awards and we have that was it. actually I really liked Social Network. I mean I don't think it was maybe that historically accurate. It, it totally whitewashed or didn't even actually touch on at all the intelligence agency connections to the creation right. of Facebook, the DARPA project, and whatnot, but. I thought that as just as a movie and as a study in psychopathy, I think the social network and stylistically yep. is really well done. It's like a horror movie, right? Like it's actually yeah, well, it's a very frightening film. Same and actually it's same with Gone Girl because that's you have basically there uh, a female psychopathy, right? And so we're shifting away in I guess the feminist lib narrative of the archetype of the super hot male, uh, you know. Right, uh, like me. Serial killer. Right? No, well, if you want to say you're a serial killer, I mean, you do kind no, of... No, no, like she's a no, super you, hot male. You've got a Jeffrey Badonkadonk something about you, I'll say that, but... Um, Thanks, I appreciate I'm more that. Of a Ted, I'm more of a know. Ted Bundy, I think, in terms of, you know... I mean, I'm kind of more like Ted Bundy handsome. You've got like a Ted Bundy creepiness to you okay. if you're talking about that. I'm yeah. like, like a lot of ladies, they really think they think Bundy's kind of, kind of handsome. I get that a lot. You look like Ted Bundy. I don't know, I, I just... Yeah, I mean, if I'm Ted Bundy, you're Jeffrey Badonkadonk, for sure. That's right. But just as long as we agree that in Fight Club, you're Edward Norton and I'm Brad Pitt, obviously. <laughs> I thought you are more of a bitch tits, but okay, whatever. Okay. <laughs> you're more of a meatloaf, I guess. Mob and his but... bitch tits. <laughs> you're, 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 yeah, I guess if, if, if you're going to be more like Jared Leto after he gets his facial reconstruction um, in the scene later on in the movie. You're I'm like Jared like, Leto before. When he's still, <laughs> you're yeah. more like Jared Leto when he gained a bunch of weight to become a creepy serial killer himself. If you remember when he was Mark, Mark David Chapman, so that's like that's Did the he, play, he played a fat guy. That's funny because didn't he lose a bunch of weight to play Joker in that yeah. bad movie I never saw? Well, yeah, was. that's the he's um, doing method acting, so he's yeah oh, he, did, he, he yeah, got he fat like to trans. be uh, he got fat to be Mark David Chapman, and then he got skinny to be what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, so Leto. Well, what's weird is Leto was in this this movie as well. I didn't remember uh, that. Yeah, you you pointed that out. I'd forgotten he was in this. <clears throat> yeah, that scene comes up later. We'll talk about. I think that's kind of an important scene that he shows up in, though. So but, uh, yeah, back to the. So let's get to the to movie pretending. then. So this it comes from a book, uh, famous Chuck Palahniuk book, and I've not read the book. I don't really care about these kind of, you know, popular 90s fiction texts that were coming out around this time. I, I just never got into it. In fact, 1999, I was in like my super evangelical phase. So I think I did watch this when it came out to rent on VHS, but I don't, I don't remember seeing no, it. I was into more like underground stuff, like like One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, you know, like hip hop influence stuff, like hop on pop. Do you, do you think you saw this in the theater back in the time? No, I, did, I definitely didn't. I saw this, I saw this two years after when it came out on DVD. And I kind of, I actually really, I did enjoy it when I first saw it. Um, I was, I was surprised that how much I enjoyed it. But have you, like, Paulinuk, have you done much, re much research? And I got I a did. couple notes here. I did because, and stuff. yeah, talk about so that. I did. I, I, so he's interesting because, um, He's part of this uh, I uh, this group that does like these public pranks, and they're kind of they're, they're anarchists. I'm trying to remember the, the cacophony society. That's it, the cacophony society, and they're preceded by this group called the Suicide Club from San Francisco, which engaged in a lot of pranking on a wide scale, um, performance art, you know, all kinds of weird stuff, which. Uh, overlaps as we can see with anarchism and then it turns out of course Polaniak is gay and that's going to be relevant because there are going to be some interesting sort of homoerotic themes going on in the movie which yeah. will relate to uh i think the manosphere to a degree because this movie in a in a, a indirect way kind of predicts the manosphere the rise of the manosphere which we've seen in the last 10 years 15 years but it also uh, includes the element of going beyond even that of, of what we think of as normal masculinity, having a family and defending society and this kind of stuff. No, it's actually hyper masculinity in a pagan way where we, where we, yeah. we even get these sort of, um, you know, 
kind of subtle, you know, gay themes in it. And that makes sense now that we know. I mean, it's not, it's not even that subtle. (laughs) I mean, it's kind of overt, like throughout the movie. I mean, the scene when Brad Pitt's in the, in the bathtub and he's bathing himself. Oh yeah. yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. I like Norton sitting next to the tub and he's talking to Brad Pitt and Brad Pitt's telling him, he's like, you know, our father's bailed on us, this and that. Edward Norton starts pouring out his heart to him saying, oh, you know, my dad. That's right. That is kind of gay. Yeah. My dad left me when I was a young boy. I mean, they're having this like pillow talk conversation there uh, at the bathtub. And then Brad Pitt tells him something. He says, um, he's like, you know, we're a generation raised by women. And uh, maybe maybe another woman is not the answer for us. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I've forgotten, too, how how kind of flamboyant. Uh, Brad Pitt dresses and so. Oh yeah, scenes. he dressed very effeminate. Like right. he's wearing this, uh, like these blouses and these like women's uh, sunglasses and stuff. Very, very effeminate. And he became like this. This movie kind of propelled him to like the next level of kind of like sex symboldom. Yeah. Right. I mean, and then in a movie that's critiquing consumerism, it's funny because Brad Pitt's physique in this movie becomes a, like a consumer object, right? Like everybody after Fight Club starts going to the gym and saying, you know, I want the physique of Brad Pitt in Fight Club. And this is still like a lot of people, they want to get fit, they want to get in shape. And that becomes, well, I want to look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club, right? And then even that, the the, the movie is almost self-aware of this, it seems, of like, I mean, you casting Pitt, who was, you know, one of the, you know, whatever, like the sexiest man in the world type guy, like him and George Clooney at this time were probably like the dudes. Right, the main dudes, yeah. Right. They're kind of like Jay and I are now, right? Like the guys that everybody wants to be the most attractive men in the world, huge celebrities, e-celebs, like now we're more popular. Right. Than but uh, yeah, the the scene that, so Brad Pitt's character, Tyler Durden, and then the unnamed narrator who you who you later find out is Tyler Durden. Um, they're on a bus and there's a Calvin Klein ad and there's, you know, the guy's naked with underwear on, yep. like all like ripped and, and Edward Norton kind of leans over real, you know, like kind of creepy, kind of kind of little little no homo vibe there, like says to Brad Pitt, um, is that what a man looks like? Or is that a, is that what a man is? And then they mock it. And then the next scene is Brad Pitt with his shirt off, greased up, yeah. like the iconic scene that everybody wanted to look like Brad Pitt when his physique became a consumer object after this film. So kind of weird meta. That was meta. That, that's those are good insights. Yeah. Um <clears throat> when I was watching it back in the day, I don't recall any of the the gay stuff. Of course, I don't think nobody really knew Poloniak was gay until he, he came out in two thousand seven or something. It said on his, he was like forced to, I guess. Yeah, yeah, on was, his bio, some a journalist said they were going to out him or something, but or he thought they were. Um, so let me tell you my th- this was somebody's analysis. Uh, I read an ar- article, uh, and then I read uh, or Jamie did analysis uh, as well, and see what you think of this overall thesis. You're going to plagiarize your wife? Come on. Well, man. no, we watch movies <sighs> together and, um, cause I, I have a good relationship with mine. So I know that you guys probably, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you wouldn't know about that, yeah. but, um, yeah, well, my, I, I got to ask. Yeah. My, mine's boyfriend sometimes. Well, yeah, exactly. Watch, right. <laughs> when she lets you into the room to watch TV, you and your wife, <laughs> when she lets me out of the she kennel, lets you come watch know. cartoons on Saturday mornings. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got to stay in the kennel when, when they do that. <laughs> So, um, Fight Club is about a cult mentality that draws people in on the basis of partial truths. Then, so that's the first half of the movie is, right, an accurate kind of or semi-accurate critique of modern society, modern city living, the the soy bug man of the city, right, the consumer rootless bug man, Um, valid critiques. And then we start to realize that the more time progresses in the film it's getting crazier and crazier so the second half of the film is actually all the ways in which tyler's critique are incorrect so he's actually shown to be wrong he's shown to be uh a it's this weird cult of personality i know that he's an alter but uh my theory as i watched it this new time was that not just that this is an alter personality but rather it's almost like he's acting in a demonic way so I, th- I kind of see Tyler Durden as a straight up demon, which, you know, he's kind of like screw tape letters where you have screw tape leading people on with these kind of half truths. Tyler's doing the same thing and it's going to progress into not just cult of personality and a critique of that, but essentially that this nihilistic 
presentation doesn't have any real answers or solutions as to how we're supposed to live or what the answer is. It becomes this sort of nihilistic idea of let's just tear it all down for tearing it down's sake and we'll reboot civilization in some you know cyclical way and maybe it'll be better this next time around but other than that it's just pure, it's raw will to will to power there's no there's nothing else except pure natural uh predatory dominance and that's why it doesn't matter anymore about sexuality is not about uh you know furthering the species and having a family even right. sexuality is now just raw dominance and beating the crap out of it. Anybody who right, even it, calls it sport effing, right? Like, and there's a line. Where and that, like, yeah, and what, when, yeah. And when and Helena, the scene with the condoms yeah. and the toilet, it's like this, this, and then she, she has a line. Marla Singer's character has a line about condoms and how, you know, they're like the, what she calls them, like the glass slippers where you wear them for one night, you dance all night and then what? they get yeah. thrown away from him. And I, I'm not going to be too graphic for YouTube, but you know, when, when they're doing it, uh, in, the, the Helena Bonham Carter and, and Tyler, <clears throat> it's all, it's loud and it sounds like the fights and so you know, when, when there's yeah. the doors opened up, she's falling off the bed, like he's throwing her around the room and stuff. So it's, it's like a fight as well. And it's all just about, you know, sort of pure animalistic dominance. And the part of the film is saying that that's what's missing. Men have been emasculated. And so when they go to these therapy groups and we can go get into the film, we have this Edward Norton as this sort of mind numbed uh, bug man who works at a boring you know insurance job uh, in the city and he's emasculated and he's sick of him. He's mad at himself. And so he's addicted to going to addiction counseling, which is supposed to kind of be satirical and ironic. Right. Uh, and he's going to the addiction <clears throat> counseling, we think originally because. Um, he's just unhappy and he can't be, there's a line where he says something like, I was almost the perfect uh, person, the fully fulfilled person, because I almost had enough of the right Gucci suits and Ikea, you know, crap in my apartment. He's like, I was almost there. And that's right before the, or right after the, you know, his apartment has been blowed up, which we'll find out later that that's actually Tyler that, 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 that did that. But um, all that to say that, so what we have this critique right this accurate critique of the inability of consumerism to fulfill us it's emasculating us and so now he's going to this testicular removal uh test uh, testicular cancer um therapy group and that's symbolic of modern man being emasculated he even meets right meatloaf there who's grown giant double d breasts because of the estrogen they've said that he's over overly exposed to estrogen which again again predicting you know soy men what do you think about those predictive elements and all that yeah well i mean there's a lot there's a lot there like when you said uh that talking about the sexual the the twist in sexuality how sexuality becoming you know sex is violence and violence is sexy right so this is like the the thing that mass media has done so there is this critique of that in there while really playing into it right um and even before the first fight before um all right when uh, brad pitt's character and edward norton's character are outside the bar norton's whole home has just been uh destroyed his condo was blown up and all his ikea stuff and his uh all his collected possessions were blown up and uh he wants to ask brad pitt's character if he can like crash at his place or something and brad pick brad pitt says to him why don't you just why don't you just uh like uh, what does he say cut the foreplay he's like cut the foreplay and just ask me so you you know the the sexual innuendo starts from right off from the very beginning yeah. and in the first encounter on the airplane is like you know they're flirtatiously you know back and forth the pitt's character is trying to get him intrigued he's running basically pickup artist style game on Edward Norton by, you know, saying interesting and provocative things, um, makes a sexual statement. Do I give you the ass or the, or the crotch when I pass you? Right. So it's like, there's all this kind of, you know, hypersexual imagery happening. Right. And, um, and that's, that's woven throughout the entire film. So, you mean the, the, the fight encounters and the sexual encounters being both kind of, uh, uh, aesthetically linked and yoked is is very intentional. And Polynuk being, you know, a closeted homosexual uh, with a strange relationship with his father. If anybody watched his interview with Rogan, it was kind of he made some strange comments on um, on that one. He talked about how his well father the died. Uh, father mm -hmm. archetype and the relationship between um, Edward as the son. He constantly references right his father issues and his mother issues. 
Right, and right. They, and they come the up in the con- stuff. exactly. They come up in the context of his relationship to Helena Bonham Carter, and the relationship to to Tyler as a father figure. So it's it's just right. weird. And then well, Tyler says to him uh, later on, like in the uh, in this uh, the scene where kind of the the demonic stuff kind of really ramps up, where he, he I guess if you look at the full character arc, he's actually self harming in this scene with right. a lie when they're in the kitchen. And, uh, but he says to him, uh, what he says, our, our, our fathers were our models for God. If our fathers bailed, yes. what does that tell us about God? Exactly. And then he says, we don't need God. He goes on to say, we don't need him. Um, and so there's this kind of, you know, the rejection of God, the open nihilism of the character. It's, it's just reflective of the, like the generation of the boomers in many ways, right? Like Polinuk was born in 1962. He's a quintessential boomer. He's an, he's like a boomer edge Lord burning man guy. You know, I mean, he, he's, he's always, he's a big burner. He's really into this. Yeah. But what's aesthetic. right. What, what's interesting about, well, yeah, that, that cacophony group too, was some of the first people to form yeah. Bur- burning man. So that, uh, anarcho performance art group that he's a part of is where burning man comes from. So you're, you're absolutely yeah. right about that. Yeah. And, uh, the, the weird part is that if you think back to Terrence McKenna and all those goobers, like when the counterculture started kicking off they they kind of went in different directions where there was a bunch of them like McKenna that were actually saying, we need less masculinity and we need more femininity. Society becomes, needs to become totally yeah. feminized with a goddess figure. But there's some of these other figures went in a different direction and they were promoting, uh, as you know, the, the archaic revival, the primitive primitivism and archaic revival and sort of a neo-masculinity that was yeah. explicitly pagan and this is where we get well and, and also ken kesey and the merry pranksters were really the precursors yep. to the cacophony groups and the, a lot of the san francisco scene and they were very in- influential throughout oregon washington california and northern california and kesey himself was kind of this you know burly hyper masculine like back to the land type guy which a lot, you know, a lot of people related to him more than they did to the, you know, Leary characters and some yeah. of these other guys that were associated with that scene. Um, and and Polinuk, he grew up. He was a young kid. He was at the he's at the tail end of the Boomer generation. But you know, the the destruction and the the chaos of like what it became Project Mayhem in the film. It's really emblematic of that that kind of like what Father Sarah from Rose would call like that active nihilism, yes. the nihilism of annihilation, the nihilism exactly. of destruction. So the the only way to enlightenment for the boomers is not just uh, well embracing you know Eastern religion. Some of these guys went to, but it's like no, it's a full on disillusion of the self in the way that Eastern religions actually uh, kind of teach. You know the. Uh, kind of mainstream Buddhist outlook, but it's 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 also an an absolute assault on all norms, all standards, and exactly. on everything. And it's like this Bakunistic. Uh, you know, you read like Bakunin and his yeah, uh, it's revolutionary full catechism. On, it's, it becomes like a committed anarchism to the point of uh, revolution for revolution's sake. Right, the final yeah. stage that Father Stephen Rose <laughs> talks about, which is uh, destruction for destruction's sake. That's where the the film goes when he fully listens to, you know, to Tyler Durden. I mean, Tyler Durden basically fully possesses him and takes over and has concocted this giant, uh, great reset. They even call it year zero, which is referencing yeah. the, the French revolution and, and Maoism and all this stuff to start everything over in a revolutionary way. Yeah. So there is this like Marxist Maoist kind of thing with Durden's, uh, in Durden's philosophy, but then it's also, it's very, it's kind of like, um, well, it's it's uh, radically individualistic though, so it's like it's like right, an anarcho. Like Rous- well, yeah, Bakunin's like, right. You mentioned Bakunin; he's perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's kind of the the main one that comes to mind is Bakunin. I don't think that many people are reading Bakunin these days, but like if you read his Revolutionary Catechism, I think that's what it's called. Is uh, the, that's that kind of lays out the the philosophy there. That R- Rousseau, really by the mean. way, is great to mention. I put Rousseau in the notes because Rousseau yeah. said that civilization wasn't emasculating thing. That's a big part of this film. Right, right. I'm trying to find, there's this line that I wrote down. He says, uh, uh, we reject the basic assumptions of civilization, especially the importance of material possessions. I mean, yes. that could that could be, that's like lifted right from Rousseau. Um, and also, Weishaupt, right, was really influenced by Rousseau exactly. and a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers. So the actual uh, Illuminists, the, uh, the the group from Weishaupt and Bavaria was 
very similar to Durden's worldview. Now, the yes. film itself follows a character arc. It's, there's this story between Helena Bonham, Car uh, Bonham, Bonham Carter and uh, uh, Norton's character. Uh, it's this love story, right? This broken, twisted, uh, modernist, postmodernist, I guess you would say, love story. But what's really interesting, the most interesting part of this are the subversive elements of the film. Yes. The, the, it does kind of lay out a lot of the stuff that you would find in like the, uh, the anarchist cookbook type I, stuff. I, I wrote these... down anarchist cookbook. Exactly. Because they start, it starts to yeah. become a syndicalism, right? Anarcho syndicalism. Yeah. Yes. And, and what's, what's so strange is like this, I think a lot of people did resonate with this film at the time because the late nineties, mid nineties, early two thousands, there were a ton of people that were completely disillusioned with the, you know, the bubblegum pop culture, the, uh, you know, this, this is when like in sync, in sync. Yeah. yeah, exactly. 98 degrees. Yeah. All, yeah. all the bands that you're usually singing when that I listen to when yeah. you're in the shower, all the bands that I'm still yeah. super into, like that people were really sick of this, this fake culture. And I remember, you know, 99, I was, what was I? 12, I was 12 years old in 1999. I was in eighth grade. And I remember, I mean, that's when Columbine happened too. So there was this rise in kind of like the domestic um, uh, terroriz terrorization <laughs> of of the populace with these mass events, right? And the, that that event, that particular event at that school was um, was right around when this movie came out. And this movie does have references to. Yeah. It, an event like that happening it, in an office. Deep, Edward yeah. Norton threatens. Yeah, exactly. Deep events. We'll get to some of the deep events when we get, you know, to, obviously everybody knows the film closes with the idea of controlled demo. You know what? And resetting society. He calls it year zero. Um, before we get to that, though, there's a couple things that came to mind. I didn't want to touch on, which was first that what I was getting at with the people who weren't along with Terrence McKenna. Some of those people were the predecessors to today's neo-pagan movement. And the rise of uh, masculinity that is, um, what, what am I trying Aubrey to say? Aubrey Marcus masculinity, we'll call it. Uh, or, yeah, or the, uh, uh, do you remember Honest. Jack Donovan when he when he got popular um, yeah. as, a man, as an early Manosphere guy, like in 2012, 13, 14? And, um, you know, he, he was openly uh, a gay Manosphere figure. And so there was this element to which a lot of Manosphere stuff was evolving into neo-paganism uh wotanism uh and even uh, uh migtow overlapping with sometimes uh gay stuff because the idea was actually we shouldn't just criticize women actual women themselves are the problem of society right yeah and well the way women are just literally objects to be used and abused they're they're, they're just sex objects in in a lot of the um <clears throat> the, the migtow men going their own way and the yes. uh like the pickup artist. I mean, look at Andrew Tate. Like, I mean, is this is the Andrew Tate and well, Tristan Tate live together, two grown men that live together, abuse and traffic women together, using women's bodies to enrich themselves, right? And hacking the matrix, getting out of the matrix. Uh, how, and what? How do you hack the matrix? Well, by by trafficking women so that you can enrich yourself and buy Bugattis and brag about it online, and then get people to spam your links online and teach people, you know, uh, the Amazon affiliate marketing and how. To I know, I I know you're a big fan of the Tates, but, <laughs> but what I want to know is, uh, do you think this movie predicts the uh, in any kind of maybe it was intentional or not? I don't know, but. Do, I do think there is like a, you know, PSYOP Intel component to some of the, the red pill stuff as well. It's sort of like the flip, right? It's the flip version of the feminist stuff, it's like the male version of the feminist stuff, the flip. Yeah, version. exactly. I've but what, that but, but do you feminism. think that this movie predicts or, or sort of uh, suggests that this would be a kind of a rising problem within the culture that men would want to have this kind of, um, searching for their masculinity again uh and then it would manifest in these weird groups that might be co-opted uh or turned into even some kind of a a fed kind of thing because that's what that kind of happens right if you remember yeah. by the end of the film uh the the law enforcement is part of the the operation right because even edward norton can't get them to stop when he's talking to the police and the <laughs> yeah feds. yeah the group has the group has infiltrated every level i mean it's like the, the end of the film is kind of actually kind of it's very humorous the movie it's actually it's uh, a satire yeah 
Yeah, it's it, it's hard to it's hard to hate on it. It's it's a very kind of boomerish film, but it, there there is. Uh, well, do you think that it signifies the manosphere stuff? Is what I'm getting at. Well, I What's think your... I think the manosphere stuff is tapping into the same kind of spiritual vein and that same kind of cultural phenomenon, that wave that's coming from the nihilistic rejection of all values that the boomers really just dove straight into. Right. And um, so I think it is, it's the natural result of that, right? Old God, it's like Nietzsche, right? It's a, it's like, well, God is dead. Now what? <laughs> right. So our, we don't have dads. Our dads are right. a bunch of, you know, Homer Simpson and, uh, and Archie Bunker of feminized pussies. And now what do we do? We've been raised by women, single mothers raising us. This is kind of parroted throughout the movie. Right. And so what ends up happening is uh, Norton's character latches on to Durden, who he ends up, you know, realizing, oh, Durden is me. And this kind of, I don't know, it's a little, it's a little bit hokey as far as uh, the, the, the plot piece, but the, uh, the character that becomes a surrogate father figure is just a cartoonish, self-destructed as you said like a a demon right his, his his new daddy the god is dead to them and then their daddy becomes this satanic demon that takes masculinity into this Perverts hyper it. violent uh extreme cartoonish thing which is you know what you see now with the manosphere stuff yeah with andrew and tristan tate with these people it's the same it's the same spirit. It's like that's the zeitgeist that the film was tapping into. And I don't think that uh, – I feel like Palinuk, I don't think – he's critiquing certain things, but I feel like he's just – with a lot of these writers and with a lot of this art, I don't think this comes out consciously. I think Palinuk is as much of a product of this art as he is a purveyor of this art. And maybe his book was really insightful and there are interesting things. And in, like the, the whole soap metaphor is – it's funny. It's it's a it's a good metaphor. You remember the he, they're making soap out of the, the rendering out of, the out of humans, yeah, from liposuction clinics that they steal out of the trash. They dumpster dive for for yuppies, uh, for sacks of yuppie fat, and then render it in order to like eventually use make it make explosives with it, and then you know kind of cause the destruction of the world around them and the chaos that will lead to the reset of everything so i mean the, these metaphors are some of them are pretty funny and real insightful but palinuk being you know basically a, a boomer merry prankster uh you know open homosexual who was a closeted homosexual until what 2004 or seven or whatever um really gives you kind of insight you know when you look at his bio and then his his interviews with Rogan uh, or like Tim Ferriss, you get some insight into it. And I don't think he's uh, I don't think he's that self aware of it because he's he's yeah. kind of a product of it as well. Well, the other element that w that stands out early on in the film is when we begin to see Norton and and Tyler Durden kind of interacting in a more uh, it's getting more and more dangerous, right? The game is getting upped, and we find out that. Uh, Durden requires kind of more and more tests and feats of what what is masculinity and obedience. So it becomes this sort of raw worship of power. But before yeah. we get to that, one of the first things that happens is there's a, there's a weird breaking of the fourth wall, when, which is, doesn't happen all the time in theater and movies, but it's used as a device to kind of alert the audience that something else or some kind of new or important event's happening, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a technique. And I think the reason it's done in the scene when uh, we learn that Tyler cuts out and splices into ch uh, children's movies and normal PG movies, prawn, uh, he's actually a nefarious character, right? I mean, this is a really bizarre, dark, desensitizing thing to do. And so it's he's intentionally not just uh, engaging in, you know, low-level anarcho, you know, destruction of political stuff or... Uh, throwing a, a wrench in the gears, politically speaking, or in terms of logistics of, of society's, you know, economy or whatever, which they later do with mayhem. He's actually evil in the sense that, like, he's willing to um, disturb and mess up children. He's that destructive. To, I mean, he really wants to see the complete destruction of society. Now, we know later on that this is actually why Edward Norton can't sleep at night is because he's at the movie theater splicing in the prawn images to um desensitize and mess up mess up kids well, so and it's, yeah it's and really it's not dark. just that it's like 
the, he's got that line. He's like a, a big, nice, meaty, you know, blink. Uh, so, I mean, in the, the end of the movie, it actually ends with they flash a, a, a dude's right. wang up on the screen. So, I mean, it's it's that those moments in the film really make it, I don't know, it leaves you with this kind of achy feeling. Uh, it's really well, but, but, th- but that's, I mean, that's explicitly demonic. I mean, the desire to yeah. mess with children. I mean, this is like, yeah. you know, Durden is more than just a, uh, an altar that represents the lack of masculinity in society. He's actually a demonic altar in, uh, uh, in, in the head of Edward Norton. And he's going to progressively require more and more sacrifice. You notice he calls it human sacrifice too. Remember well, that's the metaphor when he's talking exactly about the soap. Fat. He's like, well, you, you, you know how, how was he? He says, you know how lie was discovered. And right. he gives this anecdote about human sacrifice victims and their, you know, the ashes uh, that were in the water at certain points in the water when the ashes would meet the fat, it would, it would create that froth and that's how you get soap. So yeah, the humans, he calls, he calls people space monkeys too, right? And the dehumanization phase of his cult, which is like, it's funny because this calling out the cult of consumerism is what, you know, leads Edward Norton's character into being so attracted to the philosophy right. of destruction that Pitt's character gives him. But then that philosophy turns on everyone else. And actually they, he just makes a big dehumanizing cult where he turns people into. He gets more and more automatons. consistent. Right. Yeah. Right. And I like, <laughs> I love the movement uh, from uh, kind of just tests of masculinity at first. And then Tyler gradually shifts and moves it into a cult. And it's, yeah. it, it literally so it first becomes a, a guy a thing for guys to kind of express their their fighting. It it evolves out of the self help therapy domain with when they're going to all these therapy meetings. They're addicted to going to addiction therapy. Then it becomes a an outlet for guys to have boxing matches, you know, bare knuckle. Then it evolves into a secret society, and it really begins to take on the characteristics, uh, like Tristan said, of a cult. And then it becomes a paramilitary organization to start turns into a black ops organization where you're literally undergoing boot camp training when you come to the door, right? And you have to stand outside for three days and three nights and not say a word and right. And they're just rendering you get rendering aloe and making and making explosives and stuff. And it's like, yeah, they it ends up becoming a uh, a full on you know terror group that uh, it's a paramilitary that, that cult exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it becomes like a Jim Jones cult too. Right? Right. He's playing looping mantras, you know. The, and the mantras are like, you know, you are nothing. You are the, uh, you are the. What is it like? You are just dung heaps. <laughs> you are, you are not well, the, a person. And, and there's clues early on that Tyler is going to lead it into something religious because uh, when they're having one of the early fights, there's a there's a pile of blood there. I think it's Edward Orange's blood, and there's there's a phrase something like, "Are you are you ready for the blood of rege- redemption?" But it's not the blood of Jesus; it's the blood of human sacrifice and human fighting, right? So it's the it's yeah. nature in process, which is predator prey relationships producing, right? The the dominance hierarchies of one uh, entity or one being coming out on top, and yeah. so the argument is that hey, as Tyler tells tells Edward Norton, he's like. All of society is this way. Society is what's emasculated us, made us unhappy. Have you not figured out that it's time for it to come down and be destroyed? The real fight isn't men against each other in Fight Club. It's men destroying society when you're initiated into my paramilitary anarcho cult. Yeah. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. It was funny because uh, there's a little line from uh, Norton where he says Fight Club was, uh, he, he says that, the crowd screams in tongues like a Pentecostal church. Uh, and he says, we all felt saved after exactly. the end of these sessions. So um, he says, it becomes a reason to get your hair, to cut your hair short and trim your nails. So it's like, you know, and again, back with the kind of, you know, kind of uh, homo, homo erotic <clears throat> and, uh, you know, pruning yourself and preening yourself for fight club. Right. So everything that they're fighting against, they end up actually becoming in a way, they become this death cult that destroys individual uh, individuality that destroys identity. Uh, they become this, you know, kind of black hole cult. Yeah, That's what, that's what, t- t- uh, as the second half of the movie progresses, we actually find out that Tyler is, setting up his own society, his own cult, his own uh, exactly destruction of uh, individuality. 
and it's going to be completely destructive. So it's just as destructive, maybe even more destructive than the previous instantiation of. He becomes an accelerationist too, right? So they that's start, it exactly. You know, he becomes he gets this accelerationist ideology, and 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 they start they spread propaganda as well. Remember in that montage scene, they're putting propaganda on airplanes. They're putting, uh, you know, billboards up that say like you can water your grass with motor, fertilize your yard with motor oil. And they say it's from the EPA. So it's like this anti-authoritarian trickster kind of demonic, playful energy, but they're also harming people, right? They're, 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 uh, lead, they're, they're just, they're killing people as well. They don't care about the repercussions of their actions. It's just pure destruction for destruction's sake. Yeah. Well, eventually when bitch, Kit tits gets killed uh you know tyler says well you got to break a few eggs right to yeah. scrambled scrambled eggs so, so people are going to yeah. die it's going to happen and he, he basically just says ultimately right society needs to come down but we're starting to realize that as the film progresses it's turning it, it tyler is more and more becoming a demonic figure and it's almost going to lead to the suicide of of Edward Norton because as you're pointing out like to be more and more it's like Tyler's getting more and more consistent over time or forcing Edward Norton to be more and more consistent say hey look if society needs to come down if everything you know we're all gonna die maybe I should just die right I mean that's what that's essentially what we find in the last scene when he's trying to get Edward Norton to get rid of him I don't really understand why at the end, I can ask you about this maybe later if you don't want to get to the end now, but like when he shoots and it comes out of his mouth, I don't understand why that gets rid of the altar demon Tyler Durden. Like, I don't, I don't get what, why. Yeah, that. that's why I'm saying it's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of aspects of the, the narrative that are interesting. There's kind of some bait and switches that happen. There's real interesting foreshadowing that he does. You could tell that the book, you know, I think it was a short book. I never read the novel, but it seems like stylistically it was kind of an interestingly laid out book. I've heard, I never read the book again, but I've heard that the ending of the book is slightly different than the ending of the movie. Um, so I'm not sure how it ends in the in the book, but the ending is really lackluster in, uh, in the film. It's kind of stupid. It's just like, really, that's how you're going to do it. Norton, you know, gets driven to suicide in this, you know, frenzied crescendo at the end. And he's kind of confronting Durden. Durden's holding the gun. And then Edward, Edward Norton's character is like, well, if you're holding the gun, I'm holding the gun because we're the same person, right? And then he, you know, pops himself in the mouth, blows his cheek out the side. And then but and then Brad Pitt's head is blown out the backside. Exactly. And his character dies. It makes no sense. There's no, it's stupid. I think it's just like, I think... Just a way to get like, rid well, how of How are we going to end this? Yeah, yeah, yeah we got to get, gotta rid, get of rid of his character. And then we're going to have him and Marla at the end. Like, love conquers all. Like, well, okay, like, uh, I'm all better now. I cured my mental illness. And destroyed and, uh, all of, uh, you know, city, the civilization. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Uh, so the only way that he f he becomes whole in the end is when society has been destroyed. That's that's the symbolism there. Because remember, well, Edward, this, just try, society's destroyed, right? At the same time as Durden's character is destroyed, and what's right. left is uh, a man and a woman watching the crumbling ruins. Year zero. Of it's a, yeah, it's a great reset, new start. Adam and Eve. You know, it's year zero. That's exact, yeah. and that's what Tyler had planned the whole time. But yeah. what I wanted to ask you next was: there's this connection throughout the film between the 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 notion of the archetype of masculinity the individual character's father and God, the father, right? You, we, we hinted at this earlier and I'm just wondering, I think it, it has to be the case that the loss of God, the father, it's not accidental that that goes along with the loss of the notion of patriarchy and the importance of fathers in society. Those things go together, right? So as you said, Nietzsche talked about death yeah. of God, death of God, the father. And that's why in society where a society where feminism is on the rise and the goddess, this is seen to be by the feminists, right? And an attack on the archetype of God, the father. And some of them even say, we need to destroy the notion of God as father, because that will bring in the goddess and the, you know, the fair society and all this kind of stuff. So fathers are models for God. And so the atheism and postmodernism and the nihilism in the film, I think are corrected, connected directly to the loss of God, the father and the loss of actual fathers. Yeah, well, that's that's you know, that's why I wrote that down earlier. He says, uh, "Our fathers were our models for God. If our fathers bailed, 
what does that tell us about God? And then you know, he says, we don't need him. We don't need God. So it's very satanic. Um, and, it, you know, so that loss of God being taken as a, a, an opportunity for us to become gods, right? So Durden tries to elevate himself as God. And then in this, you know, the ultimate revolutionary act to kill God's creation, to kill yourself <laughs> is, you know, the, exactly. uh, the, the ending of the film. So the death of the self and the death of the, the whole culture around man, everything that man has built up, this house of cards of the culture that was being critiqued is destroyed as well. And then what's left is it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of stupid. I don't think, I don't think, again, I, I don't think Polinuk is some sort of, you know, literary genius and that he's really understanding these symbols. I think he's, he's just a vehicle for the spirit of the age. And that's why these, uh, that's why these kind of archetypal things end up coming through the art. I don't think the artists are necessarily that that wise to what they're actually saying. In a well, lot it of ties things. into the notion of uh, cycle, right? So uh, in the atheist, naturalist, pagan worldview, whatever you want to say, the idea is that since there's no transcendence, there's just the, na the process of nature. So nature is deified. Nature becomes... Um, a, a deifying process perhaps because all nature does is cycle predatory prey relationships right you have the cycle of the seasons you have death and rebirth and that's all there is is the natural cycle and process and so this well, is you know, Pitt, remember when Pitt's character he's talking to Edward Norton he's like you know what a duvet is it's like it's just a blanket man it's just a blanket it's just a fancy word for a blanket mm -hmm. why do we need to know this in a in a uh in like an evolutionary sense or something like that he's exactly. like why do we need to know this in a hunter gatherer sense it's like yeah we're just hunter gatherers bro and then later he goes on this rant he's like you know i he's he's talking about how his vision for the future he gives this kind of rousseauian back to the right. land destroy everything there will be uh you know drying strips of venison on the on the the tarmacs and the freeways yeah we'll be hunting elk and you'll wear leather clothes that'll last the rest of your life it's this romanticized back to back to nature um you know neo-pagan thing and you you see that now right so a lot of these people that a lot of a lot of the kids that you know really got way too into the movie fight club <laughs> are now also really into the you know the neo-pagan oh you just drink, drink blood you'll be you'll live forever the illuminati they eat, drink blood i want to drink blood and uh we we can all go back to nature and we just eat raw meat and drink blood um like this, a lot of these kids, you know, the the kids that basically turned the uh, the North, the what is it, the Northman? Like that was like their Wakanda. Um, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The the, uh, right. the, the kid, film, these are the yeah. same people who were like the Matrix. Really, was like their movie too, right? It's like so this Gnosticism and this this intense rejection yeah. of okay, we get it. You hate the culture. You see the fakeness. Everything's fake and gay, but. What is real is the question, right? And what what is good? What is true? How do you know what is true? Without, as you mentioned, the, the, the Trinitarian God, without God, without Christ, without revelation, we're just left with, uh, you know, predator-prey relations, might makes right. And, um, and yeah, I think you really tapped into something there with that. I don't know. I don't well, know yeah. So this it's the return of uh, brutalism, brutality, will to power. Um, and the reason I was talking about the cycle of nature is that uh, for a lot of esotericists, a lot of uh, you know people in even luminous circles, like they would they would agree with the idea of creative destruction that Donnie Darko talks about, right? If you remember in Donnie Darko, he says that's that the the purpose of the destruction in the novel. I think they're reading a Graham Greene novel, who was British intelligence, by the way. He says that it's, it's a uh, an act of creative destruction because to destroy something is also an art form. Um, well, that's Bakunin wrote that yeah. in, in, in the nineteenth century. The, the you know kind of you know, revolutionary communist anarchist Bakunin said that um, that the urge for destruction is a creative urge. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like this is an old idea. You know, the yeah. Freemasonry and the order out of chaos, right? Like Project Mayhem. Right, and that's because was, Project Yeah Project. Project Mayhem is supposed to be the mayhem of the return of nature, right? Nature is supposed to be chaotic. It's just just predator prey. It's just will to power, pure jungle, uh, you know, ethics, jungle law, of the jungle, pure will to power. That's what Tyler Durden's telling us, and that's why there's that sequence that you're talking about. That you know, eventually this is all going to collapse, and people are going to be, you know, frying deer on the on the interstate. 
<laughs> because we're going to go back to this year zero great reset. And here's what I'm getting at is that people think that this is counterculture and it's not. All of these things are steered into the establishment's acceptable counterculture that's packaged for you. So all the neo-pagan stuff, all of what you're seeing in this movie, right, is is the, is the system's controlled uh, future world that they want to give you. So the Great yeah. Reset, the year zero, that's from Klaus, okay? Tyler Durden is espou espousing basically Klaus philosophy. Yeah, well, and if, if you want, I think one of the most insightful passages in literature <clears throat> to, that describes kind of the ethos and the spiritual force of what you're talking about is in Dostoevsky's Demons. Uh, when yes. Pyotr Stepanovich, we had, I did this like three, three hour, two, like three hour streams on, on Dostoevsky's Demons. By the those way, those are great streams. Everybody should go watch them. Uh, they were really good. Yeah. Yeah, those are really then the the passages from from Piotr when he's talking to Stav Rogan, and he lays out um, uh, the sh Shigalyovism. It's it's just uh, it, it it really cuts to the core of what this is and how destructive the revolutionary ideology is, and it comes under the guise of liberator uh, of the liberator right comes under the guise of we're going to free the slaves we're going to we're going to wipe out the debt we're going to do this and that we're going to make everything equal and loving and happy or uh or we're going to bring justice but what comes out of it is actually just more you know mass murder and then that and then it ends up leading to uh, absolute tyranny tyranny in the worst uh, in its worst form, an atheistic tyranny that completely dehumanizes man, devalues human life. That uh, you know, we'll say, "Oh, we're here to liberate the women." Like feminism promises to liberate women, but then turns women into whores, turns women into sex objects. The the red pill thing says they're going to liberate man, and then turns man into into little little gay Andrew Tate clones who you know live alone with their brothers and treat women like sex objects, and uh, you know put out homoerotic content with them uh, you know like naked and greased up all the time. It's like this is the, the these destructive ideologies that we see pushed by the culture as counterculture are just like Jay said, it's a part of that cycle of destruction. And it's really, it's demonic. And there are people that have tapped into these and that understand what they're like, how to manipulate these forces. But then there are also people that are just absolutely enslaved to the passions and a part of this giant meat grinder that is in its essence, demonic. Well, it's not about liberation. It's about demonic destruction. Yeah. And the notion of these kind of being controlled and steered, uh, you know, honey pots and whatnot. To me, that's really I mean, that's not maybe the intention of the film, but it's obvious to us looking back from our perspective that, uh, you know, everything that Tyler is organizing and doing suspiciously matches up perfectly to a kind of controlled, you know, CIA fed type of honeypot operation where the yeah. uh you know so-called t-e-r-r-o-r -R -R operations are now run by people in the establishment right so you've got basically the feds and the police doing uh you know, going along with tyler's uh, thing and it's not i don't think it's accidental that the the paramilitary anarcho cult that tyler has created it's it has this parallel with mk ultra because mk ultra did in many of the yeah you know the studies focus on the notion of dissociation and altered uh, person alternate personalities mpd did etc and that's what we find is going on with edward norton right he has this alter whether it's a demon or just a person or whatever but it's not explicitly about mk ultra but the themes are there because it's a paramilitary cult that's uh, Edward Norton is a, in whatever sense the patsy who's who's framed for this. He's a multiple, uh, and it's you know a giant big nine event two years before the big nine event in this yeah. movie, and they right, call so it they like, call it, it con controlled yeah. demo. Yeah, and it's but yeah. it's but it's obviously like a black ops run thing in in terms of what it's able to accomplish. Yeah, and and when you look at every every uh, strata of the culture, every strata of society was involved in the orchestration of this destruct destructive spectacle of, of an event in the film, in, in Fight Club, the film. So it's like, it's very, it's real emblematic of how these destructive events 
Whereas I, I know it's it, it's re- it's always tempting to to like try to name like one small group that did this, but it's like I mean you you gotta okay yes the, the this this one small group that orchestrated you know say um you know the Project Mayhem in, in Fight Club, well you got Tyler Durden and and Edward Norton, uh, Norton's character is really being kind of demonically influenced by Tyler Durden who's this alter ego alter personality you know whatever MK Ultra the dissociative identity disorder type thing, and then he's creating all these little cells that are all interacting with other cells that are kind of out of the exactly. control of the person who initially started it, so it kind of becomes like a. Like in Dostoevsky's Demons, there are all these circles that are creating this chaotic, revolutionary fervor, spreading propaganda, engaging in um, in mischief, just like in Project Chaos. Uh, in Dostoevsky, his, his Demons is way better than – I've never read Chuck Palamuk's boomer-ass book, but guarantee you it's a thousand times better. So if you want to actually understand the social, psychological, and spiritual dynamics of this, you got to read Dostoevsky's Demons. But it's – um it, it the groups become out of control of the initial person who started it, and that initial person who started it, what is he being influenced by? Well, he is a, he is a tool of the spirit of the age. He's a tool of the zeitgeist. He's a tool of the demons, Brad Pitt. Uh, and, and and the culture itself kind of becomes this demonic death dance yeah. when when we're so we're so far along in this postmodern and postmodern age and in the throes of nihilism that whether you know whether Bush did it or Bush and Cheney or whether the yeah. them dancing the dancing um uh Mormons uh <laughs> who were the Mormons who were dancing on the bridge in New York where <laughs> those Mormons did it you know it's like well there are a lot of complicit parties but really ultimately it's this like demonic dance that the entire culture is engaged in that leads to its self destruction and almost this like pagan human sacrifice sense well, it's funny you said that because a lot of the ancient world, even up into the Renaissance, uh, they had a an esoteric and um, cyclical view of dance. So dance in ancient pagan rituals and in a lot of the, like if you look at the way that, uh, you know, Hindu ceremonies when the women dance and when they do these different like, you know, poses, the dance is actually intended to signify uh, the gods and so forth. And it's it, it, there's a dance, a circle of nature nature is pictured as a dance okay and part of that dance is creation and destruction in a, in a never-ending circle right so dance is really appropriate as a, a, a an analogy there because it's it's a dance of death and life birth and and death chaos it's and it's i mean i hate to get petersonian here but i've been going through jordan peterson's lectures and this is his philosophy peterson says this too he says that um, life is this balance between these two poles of death, destruction, and and you got to find the balance between good and evil, between dark and light, between uh, female and male, between Osiris and Isis. Right? You're this yeah. It's middle... like the, you kind of hermeticism, it is. like yeah. Blavatsky and, and Mas- I mean the Masons love using this type of you know imagery as well with the, the Joachim and Boaz and. You know, this uh, red pill, blue pill is another one of these, you know, this dialectical thing of like, you're either red pilled or you're blue pilled. Um, so it's like, I mean, now we red pill, blue pill itself is that, that's also fake and gay. It's like we should be Christ pilled. We should be we should be God pilled. And that that red pill, blue pill stuff usually ends up leading to I mean, we talked about this in streams before it ends up leading to the black pill for a lot of people. And that even either ends up in destructive nihilism or or recognizing the, the the ultimate sovereign and recognizing God's grace and recognizing God's um, God's presence in our lives and in, in the world. So yeah, we shouldn't be red pilled, blue pilled. Uh, you know, the balanced light and darkness. No, we should be embracing absolute truth, which which only comes from and can be grounded in in, in God and in God the Father. Right, so the, the the destruction of the father, the destruction of the culture, none of the you you know killing your dad and be you know getting all Oedipus is not going to get you out of the uh, get you out of it. <laughs> Oedip- Oedipus is is uh, is just creating his own hell. And there's there's this kind of Oedipal thing going on here with you know with Norton's character killing off Pitt, who was his surrogate dad, and so that he can get Helena Bonham. Uh, Bonham uh, Carter, um, yeah, I'm kind of rambling now. That's okay. I mean, <clears throat> the uh, 
there was another element too, which I think suggests uh, a potential MK Ultra reference or reading, which is that uh, he, Edward Norton doesn't just describe his entrance into the cult uh, as like initiation and salvation. He also describes it as illumination and enlightenment, right? So he says he's become enlightened. He says this a few times, actually. He's like, and at one point yeah. he even says that I don't have, to, it's like, you're profane. He's like, I'm enlightened. And he just walks past somebody, right? Like, I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. because, well, because and I'm then Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt tells him like when he, when he almost kills him in the car, uh, he tells him like, you just experienced premature enlightenment. Exactly. Well, enlightenment and, and there's a flashback that he has when they're discussing enlightenment as well. And it's when Edward Norton is, doing something, uh, you know, coitus wise with Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah. And so premature enlightenment and enlightenment is typically referring to the, uh, O R G A S M act. So there might even be an, uh, a ritual magic S E X magic component to this. Well, totally. Makes... It's like the, the coitus and the fight are very, they're, right. they're, they're juxtaposed and there is kind of this symbolic link between them throughout the film and you know like fighting and and the other effing is uh, is is um is put together and the, the sexuality is violence in the film exactly. right the sexuality is violent and the and the violence is sexualized right it was brad pitt's character becoming this uh you know iconic sex symbol after this film well did you yeah. notice too that um even the helena bottom carter character mentions that she was m-o-l-e-s-t-e-d so oh she, yeah, in a very she, graphic when gross she was young. Line. Yeah. yeah, I haven't been. Yeah, she says something about grade school, right? Like after they, right. you know, I, when I was listening to Palinuk, I guess that line is not in the book. In the book, it was like oh, she tells him, "Yeah." In the book, she tells him, "I want you to make me pregnant so I can uh, like abort your child." <laughs> this Whoa. is what the line is in the book, and then she says, or like maybe it was Pitt's character was like, "Look, my mom's gonna watch this. I don't want her to hear that," and then they did a bunch of lines that were and then they ended up landing on that one and he was like no that's even worse you should go back to the last one <laughs> apparently that's what palinuk oh, said wow. i guess palinuk or not palinuk yeah palinuk he must have had a, a lot of input in the film because he i think i think he was maybe an advisor or something or in a script advisor maybe well, even I, wrote yeah. yeah those are great points uh maybe change the topic a little bit to contemporary stuff did you notice that a lot of the things that they're involved in and, and kind of the mayhem that they're up to, uh, there have been actual cases in the last few years of um, Antifa actually being uh, arrested for doing these types of things. Like some of the, uh, I think it was a train derailment that one of the Antifa groups, right? And it's just, I, I, the reason I'm bringing that up is that to me, these are all contr obviously controlled groups, but amongst so many of the people out there in the red pill manosphere in the neo-pagan movements in, in uh, interested in uh, political activism antifa like people think that they're going to go into these different movements finding truth and 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 you know fighting the man and this kind of stuff but the irony is that the movie itself even though it's not ultimately geared towards truth the movie is still showing us at least that like th these these groups are ridiculous they're cults they're all controlled they don't actually accomplish anything and yet they're very useful because the system plays upon and utilizes these radicals, right? As if they're right everywhere and there's, you know, right wing NAZI everywhere. And this is not true, but people still fall for these honeypot uh, operations. And that's obviously well, you can associate any of the ideas that you're associated with these radical groups that may, you know, enter into you you can you can red flag certain topics and make it to where they can't even be discussed by simply associating them with certain people groups and actions yeah so that's it's a it's a methodology for just maintaining um maintaining control but you know you you made me think of uh so they had operation chaos right and then you remember in the scene when the police chief or the uh whatever like the you talking about operation mayhem in the movie yeah, I was not Operation Chaos. Operation Mayhem. <laughs> Operation Chaos. That's a real. Oh, uh, yeah. So Operation one. Mayhem. Yeah. Uh, Project Mayhem, right? That's what it was. Project Mayhem. They're talking about Project Mayhem and uh, the police and the police commissioner is trying to. There's this part where he's giving a speech uh, about this war on crime. He says, We have to win this war on crime. We're doing so well in the war on crime. And then he mentions the you know, blue pill side or whatever, it's project hope. So you project have project hope, mayhem yeah. and project hope. And, um, and of course the project mayhem, you know, becomes a tool for showing how necessary it is to have this counter 
uh, you know, have this reaction yeah, against it's, this. It's, a, it's control. a controls uh, opposition mechanism. Exactly. Yeah. And that is that is referenced in the film. Yeah, exactly. Society is actually not uh, the 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 supra super elite, the superpower class are actually not involved in the dialectic, right? They're above this. And so you've got on the one hand, the control police commissioner who has Operation Hope that's set against, uh, you know, Project Mayhem. But in the end, neither of these uh, actually does anything because Edward Norton represents that higher initiated class, so-called, who stands there amidst the creative destruction and can look upon what he's, you know, what he, what works he's wrought. And so he survives this. And then, so he, so he, he represents as an initiated, you know, uh, super being, you could say, the power elite standing above this, and they're the ones that can even do a controlled uh, demo lition, right? Uh, which happens two years later in reality. And that changes society in a profound way, such that now we have, you know, the intrusiveness of, you know, the way the Patriot Act, the intrusiveness of all this, the spying and the surveillance post, yeah. post Big Nine event. Uh, which has only been ramped up since the so-called, you know, Trump Russia election, right? That was the justification for big tech coming in and shutting everybody who disagreed down. So, so basically, all of the threats, whether it's the Big Nine event or whether it's you know uh, later T E R R O R events or whatever right wing threats, Trump and Russia threat, all they do is serve to expand this this the establishment. Yeah, the surveillance state, the yeah. police state, like it you know justifies the expansion of all this. I mean, it's funny I, that I accidentally said Operation Chaos because Operation Chaos, if anyone, that's actually real. Uh, you isn't know, that, isn't operation. that CIA? Uh, and uh it was like cia counter countering, supposedly counter, countering counter the left wing yeah exactly yeah so i mean it's like what project mayhem is kind of directly referencing operation chaos in Probably, some ways and yeah. maybe maybe palinuk i don't know maybe he actually does know a little something and or maybe it's just uh you know a, a, a cultural artifact that uh <laughs> that ends up syncing up with this but that is an interesting connection the operation chaos and project mayhem connection there. well and you notice too and the, the class relationships in the movie are interesting too because like you said it starts as this masculinity um anarcho movement and but it gradually turns into a thing where everybody that supports uh project mayhem and is part of the cells they're all the working class dudes right yeah there's no rich people there's only one point where tyler interacts with the the Italian mobster guy who owns Lou's restaurant or Lou's yeah. bar and he beats the crap out of him and is like shows him that he's crazier than he is. So the, so the yeah. mobster guy's like, yeah, whatever you can have the club. That um, was such a dumb scene. I wonder if that was in the book. That scene was real. That, that was, it was kind of dumb, dumb and he, but he, but he bleeds on him. Right. And that like, yeah. And then the guy's like, Oh, don't bleed on me again. Like, Oh yeah. You could use the bar. Just don't like pretend to vomit blood on me. Okay. You can have the basement. That was so dumb. But every but everybody that supports this this uh, anarcho revolution is the working class, which is weird. Yeah. So it's like a working. Yeah, it's class. kind of Marxist. It's a little it's right, a little, exactly. But it's not. I mean, it's more like a like yeah, Marxist Bakunin. I mean, we we really are at a time that is so similar to like 19th century Europe with with all these movements and so 19th century Europe, 19th century Russia. We're very much at a time in the 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 arc of um uh, of civilization like the story arc of western culture of this destructive nihilism we're like we're kind of reaping what we sow as a culture that has rejected god that's rejected the church that's rejected rejected orthodoxy um you know after the the, the, you know, the protestant reformation the enlightenment so-called enlightenment and um you know this where we're at now really is um so similar to the world that marx and bakunin were uh were a part of we just have more intense mass media with social media and it's more, you know, it's, we have a more powerful tool for propaganda and for subversion in social media than they could have imagined when they had the printing press at their hands. Yeah. And I mean, well, they specifically say when, uh, the, the climax of all this, uh, you know, big fake flag event is going to be basically the attack on the financial center. So whatever city they're yeah. in, they, they, they said, we're going to, we're going to basically take down the entire, uh, banking slash credit district 
So this is like nine giant skyscrapers, right, that are going to be taken down when Tyler references it as year zero. And that's really relevant because, as you know from, uh, you know, Fire in the Minds of Men, year zero is goes back to the Jacobin idea of complete, complete, starting over so yeah, I, yeah. I, do, I detect the, my fire in the minds of men well that, that's yeah, why I did, there, that's I why there's on that. anarch i know yeah you, your talks are great so there, there's elements of anarchism and elements of communism socialism in this precisely because and capitalism because all of those philosophies have their root in these enlightenment figures like one uh rousseau and vice as you said and then the jacobins right so the jacobins all right they have this this similar philosophy going on and then they decide oh, we're going to take down the entire financial district and that's what that's what's going to initiate year zero so yeah. Yeah, well, tyler durden's kind of like a saint just figure right like saint saint just they, he he was this uh kind of reveling peter pan style character who was i think he was he had all these weird relationships with women but then i think he also had so little little, little homo eroticism up in his um up in his life too so yeah he's Durden's character really reminds me of Saint Just so the the Fire in the Minds of Men series that you can find it on my YouTube and on the Rockfin channel the, that's a really good one if you want to get a grasp on kind of the revolutionary dynamics well and a lot of those revolutionaries that you're talking about actually either ended up assassinated or went mad they were actually you know, they all killed they each insane. other went crazy syphilitic uh yep. they were just they were a lot, a lot of ugly little little creatures um just you know not even not just physically but even some of them were just you know physically disgusting um, wasn't there one of them who uh like, pockmarked and you, you uh, had a great point when you were covering some of these characters in that talk i think it was that talk and when there wasn't one of them like a little too fat so the other revolutionaries decided that he was eating too much <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. they went after no, him. that's literally that was like i forget which one it was but yeah they're they're like, well, you, you're, you're too well fed to be a true revolutionary. So you <laughs> must have counter revolutionary ideas. We're going to kill you. We're, this is the French Revolution, right? The end of the 18th century. That time, like the cusp of the 19th century, end of the 18th century. Well, you were talking, and you were talking about how he was, a, he was one of the journalists, right? And so the they're all journalists. Yeah. They're all journos, <laughs> just yeah, like Marx. Right. Marx is a journalist. Um, yeah, it's it's the, the the journalist to delusional revolutionary pawn. Like, seven, like seven, 1700s French blue check mark people, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what we're looking at. The blue check, right? But these are the blue check marks that like that just couldn't make it uh to the level that they wanted to. It's it, a lot of it, the dynamics were all not about you know freeing people, it was more just about, well, I want that power. <laughs> it's like just jealousy and envy and you know, uh, extreme narcissism. Well, another element that all the revolutionaries get wrong is the diagnosing of the problem. They're always diagnosing the effects and not the root, right? So they're always pointing out, oh, society causes this problem. It's everything is external. And the irony is that even the film itself presents Edward Norton as somebody who's dissociative. He's a split yeah. person. He's divided against himself. So he represents modern man and, and he's also literally so modern man is dissociative and he's split amongst himself but quite literally he has multiple personality because uh he's he's literally divided and so that's relevant because uh i lost my point oh the the explanation is always perceived to be the structures of society oh it's the financial system oppressing me oh it's the patriarchy oppressing me oh it's the class system that's oppressing me oh it's because you have a privilege you know in this or that way that's oppressing me but it's never diagnosing an internal problem that man's problem is his heart you know right which which uh i guess so norton's character he f he feels the emptiness of consumerism and there's you know kind of a valid critique of the emptiness of consumerism but the answer to it becomes tyler durden says well just you know basically destroy yourself <laughs> just 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 wreck yourself destroy yourself and he got hit rock bottom so there's the the theme of hitting rock bottom and you know the uh the kind of hallucination he has where there's that penguin who tells him to slide right um the you, you just slide all the way down and hit absolute rock bottom what's that there's the line the famous line in the movie where it's like it's um uh it's it's only after we lost everything that we're free to do anything so um well i like, think it's i think i'm glad you mentioned that penguin part i forgot about that because 
early on when he's going to the therapy sessions, we find out that that's where he's first kind of imagining and sort of beginning to dissociate. Now, he's probably dissociated earlier, but in the film, we're seeing the process of that dissociation, not just being about him relating to another alter, but actually as the film progresses, Tyler wants to totally take over. He wants to get rid of Edward Norton so that he can fully possess and take over the body is what it seems to be. So it begins as this, just a goofy penguin saying, uh, you know, meditate and come down deeper into your subconscious. That's so that Tyler can step forward and take over. Because he, if you remember in the first scene, in the very first scene early on, when the, the he, I think it's Edward Norton there, and he's like, I, or he's talking to somebody, he says, uh, you know, I, I frequently wake up and I don't know how I got there. So he's, he's already beginning to yeah. dissociate, right? But right. it's an actual possession. And so I think that this, the, uh, imagery of the gun at the end is that Tyler wants Edward Norton to die because that would mean that Tyler fully can possess that body. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Edward Norton, the demons come to kill, steal and destroy. Right. And the, the character, I mean, they're Durden's methodologies are, uh, you know, terrorizing people, blackmailing people, extortion, petty theft right he's constantly engaged in petty theft and like larceny and just and and actually theft of automobiles and stuff and so yeah the the, the methodologies are completely demonic of him and the, well, and, the ultimate and harming goal children, demons harming children yeah. harming children and yeah yeah systematically subverting children and harming them psychologically through sexual imagery right i mean it's really uh dark stuff um good thing nobody does that anymore right like good thing that's not happening out there in the world in this month of june uh, at a mass scale so yeah i mean D durden's character promises enlightenment he promises freedom from all the problems that norton diagnoses but then incorrectly diagnoses as an external problem and then sells him on the solution of nihilism and destruction and of basically a hyper acceleration of all the same problems and isn't it funny how brad pitt's character is like you know they're critiquing capitalism and uh and you know the the valid critique of consumerism that the film presents at the same time brad pitt's chain smoke and marlboros and i think there were laws about well, i think we're supposed to it. yeah we're supposed to notice brad pitt his character is a contradiction like as the yeah, film it's a total contradiction yeah. he's wearing high like expensive clothing super high you know whatever high fashion clothes right. um and Great point. constantly drinking beer and consuming cigarettes so you know it's um it's it's, it's absolutely he's a, he's a total consumer like throughout the whole movie Absolutely. As he's saying, it's all emasculating and ridiculous and control. He's doing the very yeah. things that he's... So all he's doing is creating his own civilization, <laughs> right? Right, so this is like going back to the Manosphere now, right? The the old Manosphere world, the Andrew Tates of the world. Oh, break out of the Matrix by, you know, human trafficking a bunch Consumerism. of... Consumerism. So you can buy a Bugatti. You know, it's this is... <laughs> You're gonna. You're not gonna break out of consumerism by becoming the king of the consumers. It's just retarded. And so, yeah. So that uh, the one other thing too, I did have in my notes. I forgot to get to was just the notion, um, which I didn't. I didn't understand at first. But you remember when he's when when Edward Norton leaves his apartment and buildings and the structures are symbolic too of people's psyche in films. That's why when uh, he first starts to interact with Tyler, he moves in with Tyler into that nasty, uh, you know, ghetto house that they live in. That's symbolic of Tyler's right uh, dwellings. That's Tyler's house, and so Edward Norton going there is mean, means that Tyler's taking over because Tyler has actually destroyed uh, Edward Norton's you know condo that he has in the high rise. So this is actually again moving towards the surrendering of his personality, and and that's really made clear when. Edward Norton is sitting there reading all of these weird publications that are just randomly piled up in Tyler's, you know, crack house. And he comes across this, this stack of uh, essays written from the perspective of people's organs. And I was right, watching right. this and I'm like, what is this supposed to mean? And then I realized, Oh, th this is parts, right? So basically the organs represent parts and they have a voice and a personality because the film is about right. Alternate personalities. And yeah, that, yeah. I am, I am Jack's liver. Yes. I am, I am Jay's beautiful, luxurious hair. Um, you know, they, I am Jay's, uh, gaping soy face. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just I'm pointing out that that was actually just symbolic of uh, parts and the parts equaling um, different personas. Also, that's a good when, point. Yeah. When he talks and, on and, the phone, do you notice he dials he, when he calls uh, Tyler? That's also like a reference to calling up the alternate personality to uh, to being in in consciousness. Uh huh. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great point. There so something that made me think of something else. Um, but I think I lost it. Last point then, I guess would just be that, you know, it, it really just represents a film, uh, critiquing modernity, uh, with a postmodern perspective, but of course, postmodernism doesn't have anything to offer. And a lot of times it's, it admits, no, we don't have anything to offer. It's really just a return to brutalism, a return to paganism, or a return to will to power. That's all there is. Uh, and so when society collapses, right, we're not going to be looking to purple hair people eater. We're going to be looking to, you know, the local neo-pagan warlord to lead, to lead us to Valhalla. Right. Right? And, and these people who have these ideas... These are the people who are the least capable of surviving a situation like that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like everyone wants to, you know, these people will want to sit in a, in their, you know, coffin apartment. Um, you know, like half their half of their income goes to, you know, OnlyFans and and Andrew Tate's war room. And they're, you know, they want to sit around and think about how, you know, like, oh, bro, if it all collapsed now, like I'd I'd just be like totally the top warlord. I'd be like, I'd be just be like Mad Max and I'd have like all these bitches with me and stuff, and we'd just be like cruising. I'm like, yo, like, what's up? Like, let me get your stuff. I'm like, look how jacked I am. I shaved my chest and so I like put oil over my chest and like it'll be so sick, dude. Like, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna freaking you're not gonna survive that situation. What you're actually asking for is hell on earth. <laughs> this is not the, the, this anti-civilization oh, civilization itself well, no i mean problem. when society collapses Sorry. we're not going to be uh like freely running around cooking venison on the uh interstate like tyler says no, y'all, you're we're, gonna, we're gonna be in a we're gonna be in a freaking <laughs> fema coom pod under klaus schwab right yeah no you, none of you guys are going to be cruising around as warlords you're going to be welcome to the, yeah. welcome to the fema center we're going yeah. to show you the new way to live this is the year zero <laughs> you, you, see, uh, you ever read the road from cormac mccarthy the movie uh, i've only okay. read blood meridian but i'm familiar i watched the movie but i've only read blood meridian yeah, the, movie, the movie is kind of, the, the book's pretty decent but it's yeah it's pretty i feel like that's a much more um accurate portrayal yeah. of, of that post-apocalyptic landscape that you absolutely do not want to be living in a total collapse. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and what I'm saying is that if there is a collapse, it's probably going to be engineered to put us into some kind of, you know, Gil Bates run, Klaus run global government, right? That's not yeah. that the year zero will only serve that kind of an agenda is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's not going to be a total collapse. It'll be it would be a controlled somewhat collapse where you psychologically wreck enough people to where they think there has been a total collapse of their reality. And then you just usher in that, that new overhaul of a system. It's kind of like in Blade Runner 2049, where they talk yeah. about how there was a, there was a blackout. I forget how many years before the film in that film, there was, there was this blackout at some point in that film. And that's how they got to where they were in that, in that, um, that movie, which that's like one of the only, recent good sci-fi movies i can think of is uh blade runner 2049 but that the concept of the blackout in that film that's that's kind of what durden is pointing towards and this is something that a lot of people a lot of the elite think about this talk about this a lot of the revolutionaries in the french revolution they they, they gave a new calendar and it was year zero right the beginning of the revolutionary age the uh, you know liberty fraternity and equality but what did that result in? It resulted in a bunch of people cannibalizing each other, you know, sim symbolically cannibalizing each other. They weren't literally eating each other, but they were killing each other and spiritually eating each other alive. Um, that's that's what these revolutionaries uh, always end up creating is a cannibalistic culture based on uh, the passions, on absolute, uh, you know, greed and lust and envy and hatred and destruction. And none of that, is an answer that's not an answer fight club and project mayhem is not an answer to the consumerism hyper hyper realistic or a hyper reality that we live in 
The answer is the answer is Christ. The answer is embracing God, embracing the truth. And but that entails repentance. That entails actually changing our hearts, changing our lives, changing the way we uh, interact with people, changing the way we see ourselves, and admitting that hey, you know, yeah, there are a lot of problems out there in the world, but also the biggest problem that you got is you, <laughs> and uh, and you're not going to get past that problem by you know. Um, right. And then and, and Edward, Nor Edward Norton ends up, you know, basically completely listening to a demon. Right. So yeah. and Tyler Durden's kind of a higher version of his own narcissistic self projection, but he is also a demon. And so that's your choices here. Do you want to be Edward Norton, uh, you know, starting civilization over compacting with basically <laughs> the demonic? Uh, and by the way, the, I, one thing I noticed that made me think more and more about the demon reading of it was do you remember towards the end when the security cameras show um him having the f the final fight with tyler durden and it you see the security camera and you actually see an entity pulling yeah and yank yeah. yanking yeah. him on the security camera which means that it's not just in his head tyler durden actually has some kind of metaphysical existence right so it's essentially it's more like a demonic ghostly kind of entity than it is a mere altar in his head yeah that's a great point all right so let's uh let's do super chats this was uh great to have you back i wish i wish we could get you to do more content uh so i'm saying man it's like you just this you paid me enough you you know i mean i mean next time the fee's gonna go up i'm not cheap um but yeah you know, i'll send you i'll have my people send you the bill okay yeah have your people um, talk to my people uh obviously and yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's do the super chats we got um I don't know. I don't recognize his name. Chase H Hagard says, oh, that for, guy. Yeah, that guy he tries to pretend this. he's my brother. This is the one who tries to LARP as my okay. brother. This is, yeah, creepy, it's a, it's creepy odd, weird guy. It's an odd yeah, sort of a foreign name. I don't recognize Hagard. Um, yeah. Do you familiar. know what province is that? Is this sort of an African provincial name, Hagard? I, I think, I don't know. Okay. I, I, yeah. Never he, said, he says, great interview. Why are you mocking people like me who put tater tots in my pocket? Oh, that's actually from yesterday. I'm sorry. Hagard says again today, um, it is good to see Tristan. Um, your family keeps asking, can we communicate with you outside of YouTube super chats? We miss you. So it sounds like there's something going on with you guys that drama. Or yeah, something. Look, I, don't know. I mean, you guys know where you can contact me. Um, use coupon code big 53 life. Essentially money is the only way anyone can talk to you now. So <laughs> look, look, you've actually, I mean, come was... you've actually commodified your own communication with your family. That's ballsy, dude. I'll give you props for that man like this guy chase and this family that he's talking about they know where to get in touch with me um i mean i just i put my kid to bed tonight i, I love my family i treat do, my do kids you charge well. your I, children I was for put, the, but when i put my son to bed he do you was charge like, for that too does your son pay a well, fee I mean, you know, for I was, going i'm putting to him to bed and i'm telling him hey you know make sure to like and subscribe <laughs> Um, you can send a super chat. I threw out the so super chat. I told him you can it's use 50, big 50. 50 cents per tuck in, right? For I was like, kids. you can use big coupon code, big 53 life at chalk.com <laughs> to get 53% off all products there. And then he, he was so sweet. Cause he goes, he goes, make sure to, he's like, make sure to check out and become a subscriber at Jay's analysis.com. <laughs> what if and you I was were like, what if you were such was, a committed libertarian father that you actually charged like your your sons had to pay for the services of being, you being the father. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. a serious like, libertarian, look, kid, right? I'm like, look, kid, time is money. You got to get to bed now. I'm teaching it's you like, an important lesson here. Fifty cents for that uh, tuck in last night. <laughs> All right, uh, BMX 1966, twenty dollars. Thank you so much. Um, great stuff, Jay. Where can we get more of the retro synthesizer music? Uh, my music uh theme is all from amid the ruins 1453 go check out his channel uh good channel there prison palace three dollars i pray that chuck Palahniuk finds christ because i love his books yeah absolutely we, we hope everybody does aj hunter five dollars christopher nolan put out the movie oppenheimer it's releasing next month month what do you think that this will address and why is it important um good question i mean i think i saw the trailer i'm sure that Nolan will have union archetypes there. Um, I, what, what the thesis and the analysis will be, I have no idea. So I don't, I don't know what to think. Did about. you see there was uh, there was a quote from him, and he said that people were leaving the theater like crushed and and like they couldn't, that you know they were leaving distraught. Are you being serious? You joking? 
Yeah, no, I'm serious. Like it, it, he said, they were leaving. There was a quote from I don't know if it was a real quote. It's something I saw on like Twitter or something where no, Nolan supposedly was saying that people are leaving the screenings. Like uh, I think he said distraught or uh, like speechless, but in a, in like a traumatized way. Oh or wow! Something. No, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, get to, I could I could be literally repeating something that someone made up and threw up on Twitter though. So. <laughs> Well, we'll get uh, Bill Gates fact checkers on that claim, Tristan, right now. Yeah, um, actually, Nolan didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, NewsGuard is funded by Bill Gates, so we'll figure out what NewsGuard says about your claims there. Four and or yeah. five dollars. A lot of people want to have a god and to their god and be him too. Uh, yeah, I think that's the desire of fallen man from the garden, right? Uh, man thinks like Satan that I'll become God. TJ, five dollars. I appreciate your work. Jay, uh, you're a light in the darkness. Well, thank you for that, TJ. Much appreciated. Guys, if you would support the show, we got several more Super Chats we're going to read here. Now, Tristan, uh, your channel is Primal Edge Health. I have you linked, Tristan Haggard. It's just Tristan Haggard. Uh, oh, yeah, it's just, excuse channel. me, it's just Tristan. Now, um, everybody subscribe to him. Uh, he will put out, hopefully, more content if we get more people bugging him to do it. But I want to remind you guys, too, to head on over to chalk.com. And use the promo code J50. Do not use the faulty promo codes from uh, Tristana. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off. Yeah, don't off. use the ones that oh, actually see, I work can't do like it. Mine. I can't do the ad it's because he's just going to talk over it. So there's no point doing it. Benjamin, $5. <laughs> Have you guys seen Bo is Afraid? It is. Uh, what is your opinion? It's an Ari Aster film. And what is its meaning? Um well, I've seen his other, you know, I saw like Midsommar and whatnot, but I have not seen Bo is Afraid. So he's made these occult movies previously, I think Hereditary, right? So is is this an occult movie? Uh, so I don't know. I'll have to check it out. First time caller, $10. Does your website member get podcast fee without ads? Uh, well, you get the podcast feed of what's for subscribers. I just see Jay Dyer, YouTuber, and a college lacrosse coach that shares your name i mean if you google jay dyer i come up pretty easily even ahead of that dude so i'm not that sounds like a joke benjamin rodriguez one dollar can we get a tour of your lighting setup and bookshelf uh i think i did a video years ago about uh, showing my library but that's all different now so maybe one day i'll do that temple hat girl five dollars fight club was how the female world fell in love with brad pitt Personally, however, I think that the globalists have overcalculated their power. They keep the population uh, into nihilism to hide this. What are your thoughts on that? Tristan, what do you think about that? Are the, are the elite promoting nihilism to keep us distracted uh, from really knowing what's going on? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, there definitely would be an aspect of that, but I wouldn't say that that's like the totality of it. I think the elite promote nihilism because the elite are nihilistic <laughs> and the elite are nihilists. Um, and you know, the, the demons want to kill, steal and destroy. So I think that's their, their tools, the demons. What would you say to somebody who said, yeah, but don't they believe in transhumanism and how is that compatible with nihilism? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, tr trying to live forever in the materialistic world um, yeah, as, you know, it, as a rote materialist, saying you're going to upload your consciousness, which you can't define. Um, yeah. Well, then just, it doesn't Ben Gertzel say we're just atoms, man. Yeah. We said, we're just, yeah, we're just arranged. We just rearranged the molecules. It's like, <laughs> so I did a stream on the Ben Gertzel on um, Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan's like, well, what are we going to do about like, you know, overpopulation? It's like, well, we're all just arrangements of molecules, dude. <laughs> right. So we're going to live forever. Through. But we're just molecules in motion, man. Yeah. Right. By well, I, uploading I, I don't our know consciousness, what I am, no but I'm going to live forever because I'm going to figure out how to make myself live forever. A computer. And I also don't like being alive. So it's, I don't know. It's just. No, it's all nonsense. Stuff. Exactly. It's all completely contrary. Terry, $77, $5. Do you think that there's big nine stuff at the end of Fight Club? Absolutely. Yes. We just talked about that uh, earlier. Um, I think even people at the time in the 2000s were saying, hey, it's really weird that. Polaniak uh, talked about this. I think there's another story too about um, Polaniak and the Big Nine event. Uh, I remember that going around on a lot of the 9-11 uh, Truth websites back in the 2000s, uh, but you probably can't find that on YouTube anymore. Uh, yes, so people, uh, there is discussion of this. 
with us or against us? Chuck Palahniuk's 9-11. Interesting. Um, that is a paper that was written. That's an academic paper. Uh, anyway, so yes, people, other people in, in the past have made these connections between the big nine event and Chuck. Yeah, Palahniuk. I mean, when that in, in 2001... When it happened, a lot of people were pointing it out. I remember, you know, talking to friends about it in like 2003. Um, that definitely, definitely was on people's mind. All right. Well, we've had a great conversation. Thank you so much, Tristan, for coming on. Um, anything you want to update us, you. update us with before we head out? Oh, man. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. May, uh, you guys make sure to go check out Jay's live event over in uh, in Los Angeles. I was actually just going to boot you and do the promos because I know I'll never get a promo out for chalk while you're here. So you don't have to. Oh, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't want what I, what I'm doing is philanthropy, Jay. I want people to have the codes that actually. Okay, yeah. Work. You and Bill Gates and Jeff Simon McEffrey philanthropists, right? I mean, that's why I'm here for Jay. It's the philanthropy. By the way, David Attenborough passed away. Did you weep? When that oh, happened. I didn't know that. When did that happen? I think he did. Yeah. Um, I thought I would have thought you would have been on top of that because you, you do so many, <laughs> you've done so many David Attenborough. David Attenboomer. Yeah, I think my last Boomer, video exactly. was, was. I did like a. I think one of my maybe it was the last video. Yeah, the last video I made was all in David Attenborough's voice. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you didn't even know he maybe. passed away. Am I? Am I right? Correct. I don't know if you're right about my that. Audi audience. Audience, am I right? Didn't David Attenborough pass away? Um. Anyway, I, 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 I would have thought Tristana was keeping up because he's he's a fan club, but I guess not. Oh, I guess he passed away. When did he pass? Like a few days ago or something? No, it was a while back, I thought. Maybe I'm having a Mandela effect and he didn't really pass away, but I have a common memory that he did pass away. Hey, he's ninety. He's 97 and he's still alive. It's a, I mean, Wikipedia okay, so he did says not. he's alive. Okay. Let's see. Let's, David Attenborough in news. No, he's cool. He's ninety seven. Oh well, crap! So my man, man. Uh, all right. Well, then now I believe in Mandela effect because I I have the uh, common public memory that he passed. Oh, away. No, <laughs> he's, he's got he's got a, he's got he's got that Dran Chrome on tap. He's good. Oh, okay. All right, well, then, all right. Yeah, so he's he's doing all right. All right. Thanks, dude. Have a good <laughs> night. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it, man. And I want to remind you guys too, if you would head on over to chalk dot com, uh, use the promo code J fifty to fifty percent off the Sheila Jet. Uh, and you can get 50% off the seven wonders. These are products that will boost your mineral deficiencies. If you're deficient in minerals, as we all are, then you want to get the seven wonders. If you are deficient, deficient in toxic masculinity, then you want to get the Tonk at Ali Tonk at 100. That's my favorite. I take that on a daily basis. Uh, use the promo code J50 to get 50% off and everybody have a good night.